So we begin by looking at different air conditioner types. So I will read it out for you. So air conditioner types are window, we just looked at it uh, using a picture, a split system we saw one outdoor unit and we have all seen indoor units which are hung on high walls. Split systems also include ducted systems and they also include cassettes and then packet systems. So packet systems are complete units which have the compressor, evaporator, condenser, all the controls housed in one single body. They could be rooftop units, they could be units used for uh, telecom applications, they could be units used for uh, computer room cooling, everything is together and that is why we call it a package. And then we have chillers, so chillers are uh, used for large uh, comfort and process cooling applications. Then we have some other classifications. So these days um, if you just have a normal air conditioner, it is of no use, but if you had purchased a heat pump, you will find that it lowers your electrical power consumption because the heat pump principle allows for heat to be pumped from the environment into your comfort zone. So most of the air conditioning needs in, the, uh, in Europe and in the US were around heating and that is how their air conditioners have evolved um, for heat pumps more than uh, the air conditioners that we use here. Then we can also classify based on how we reject heat to the environment. So we could reject heat directly using an air to refrigerant heat transfer surface like a condenser coil that we saw fin on tube or we could reject heat from the refrigerant to water and then that water could be cooled using a cooling tower. So both have their uh, positives and uh, limitations, limitations with using cooling towers is the space that we need and in addition to the space the fact that we need some water to be replenished, the water that we are losing to the environment for causing the <coughs> evaporation that is driving the cooling process. Then there are also solutions where we reject heat uh, <coughs> to the earth, so it, it is um, also a way of um, rejecting heat to the environment, you could take ground water pump it through the condenser and throw it back to the ground. Then we have classifications based on whether it is a fixed speed type which means the compressor shuts on and off or it is inverter type where the motor <coughs> speed is continuously varying. In the latest in air conditioner types is a multi indoor multi outdoor option, so where several compressors come together in outdoor units and then multiple outdoor units can be connected in common refrigerant uh, pipes and then those pipes connect to several indoors. So prior to this system coming into place, it was common to use chillers and have several terminal units. So you would have air handling units, you would have fan coil units where there is heat exchange between the comfort uh, zone air and the medium which is water. The drawback in that was you were so let us look at it with some numbers, so if you look at it using some numbers we make some assumptions again and let us make an assumption that we are looking at a comfort application. So comfort application means we are targeting in a DX evaporator a temperature between 7 and 9 degrees centigrade and again for making it simpler to understand let us look at 7 degrees centigrade. So if you look at uh, <coughs> 7 degrees centigrade as the evaporating temperature and if we are uh, looking at uh, a test condition which is 27 degrees centigrade dry bulb temperature for comfort. So today if we look at testing an air conditioner for rating purposes we will use 27 degrees centigrade and we also need to specify humidity <coughs> which we do indirectly by specifying the wet bulb temperature. So these two together define uh, the cooling space and if we were to look at direct expansion system then the refrigerant goes to the compressor. So if you are looking at R22 corresponding to this we would have a pressure somewhere like uh, 70 psi gauge approx and, and that is it. So the compressor is pumping refrigerant from 70 psi to whatever is needed to reject heat in the condenser. Whereas if you look at a chilled water system, we 
we have two levels of heat transfer. The first one is we are going to reject heat to water. So, there is a delta T which is between air 27 and water. So, the typical uh, chilled water temperatures uh, would be 12 and 7. So, entering water is 12 and 7 and we look at two different temperatures in a chilled water system because we are not having a uh, two phase flow there. So, we are not having something like evaporation <laughs> happening. So, we look at a temperature which is 12 to 7 or let us say enters at 7, leaves at 12. This water again needs to be cooled using a compressor. So, we will have one more heat transfer which will lower the evaporating temperature in the chiller to somewhere close to 1 degrees if you are designing it very efficiently. Right. So, so what does it lead to? The evaporating temperature in the chiller if it is 1 to 2 degrees centigrade means we have a penalty from 7 to 2. 5 degree penalty and that penalty would lead to more energy being required for the same application. The convenience that drives the chiller uh, uses when we have large applications and multiple uh, indoors that is what is used. So, the newer systems overcome this difference instead of having several indoor units transfer heat to water and then water in another heat exchanger to refrigerant, they use multiple indoors directly transferring heat to the refrigerant. So, the 5 degree difference is, is not there and we probably will include this as something that you will evaluate. How much is the penalty associated with the 5 degree drop in evaporating temperature? To give you a clue, if you look at a performance curve of a compressor, then the power consumption is most sensitive to the suction pressure and therefore, the saturation uh, temperature corresponding to that. The sensitivity analysis best happens when you look at a compressor performance curve, we look at one temperature then another temperature then another temperature and you can see for yourself how much is it. So, this opportunity drives the development of newer systems. So, conceptually if you look at why VRV or VRF systems are becoming popular today, it is because they address this part. So far it was difficult to look at long pipelines. So, if you look at one kilometer long pipe, you normally would stay away from a split system because you would be concerned about leakages, maintenance and pressure drops and a whole lot of things. So, with technology there has been evolution by which it is possible to have systems which can address such long pipelines and multiple levels. So, you have a multi storey apartment complex and you could have units installed at different places connected to the same refrigerant pipe. Also important is to be aware of the risks with such a system. Since everything is on one pipeline which is interconnected, a leak at one place will lead to the whole system come down. The opportunities are far too many. Not all rooms that are serviced by this one system will be occupied at the same time and will operate at their full load. The demand diversity is going to be so high that you will mostly operate at part load and the part load efficiency is further utilized by the control systems to make use of the entire air uh, to refrigerant heat transfer surface available in the condensing units and also an opportunity to switch off as needed the multiple outdoor units. So, it allows for a big benefit in terms of annual energy savings and that is what is uh, something that we need to keep in mind. Now, finally, this is a design course, right? So, if you are going to look at components and you are going to look at uh, product design, then how do we begin? So, if someone asked you to design an air conditioner, what would come to your mind? How would you translate the need into a requirement document? So, this is where your thinking hats need to now come up and let us look, look at this uh, particular example which is alive for many of you. It will not happen before you graduate, hostels being air conditioned, right. So, if you were to start putting together a document which captures all that is needed, what would come to your mind? How would you go about 
specifying the air conditioner needed in different hostels. So, I want some participation here. Not. Right. So, we can say cooling capacity. What else? The outdoor condition. Okay. What about the rest? I want everyone to think. Operating So, load profile? could be included in the profile right a load profile would mean that uh, in the afternoon uh, so many rooms will be occupied and it would translate into a load so right the space that is to be a condition huh. very good very good so installation space that's what you mean right And good you use the word space because then area and height available everything becomes uh, included there. Uh, <coughs> would it be like a need or would you want to put a limit because you are worried about costs? Right. So, we can yeah, fine the concern is very valid whenever we make the solution we will need, but from a, it may not come more as a need it may come out of the complexity of variables that we will manage when we are making the system operational. Like there is an installation uh, related uh, infrastructure that needs to be worked out, but we can put it in a different way whether to have a single system or multiple systems so that we can plan that infrastructure. So, so that way we can include what you just said, right. The ducting, the ducting for the so, again we can include this here. Uh, so, this will have an impact on uh, uh, <coughs> power cable. This will also have an impact on ducting needed or not. So, let us say if we go for a multiple uh, indoor unit d x type units then we need to look at piping. So, we need to make provision for piping. If you are looking at uh, air handling units, then what you said is correct, we need to put ducting. Insulation. Yeah. So, when you say insulation, you mean whether or not we will add insulation to the walls to be able to reduce the load, right. Great. You are missing one important thing here. Okay, but no, no, that's not what I had in mind. I, I would say that you would have a budget, so we can put that as also something. <laughs> but what is the most important thing that you're missing here? Right. It is there. That should have been the first thing, right? Where will you be? What temperature? And uh, would you define only temperature, or you want to say something else? What else? So, I will help you here. So, in addition to temperature and humidity, you may want to define a certain uh, ventilation air quantity because it is going to be, if it is going to be a single unit, then you would want a defined air circulation so that we get rid of uh, CO2 and any uh, VOCs and whatever else is there. So, let us try and put together some numbers here. So, 25 degrees centigrade and uh, 50 percent RH 
would most of you agree that that will give us a, a comfortable environment? And then we can refer to some of the known uh, materials available like an ASHRAE handbook to look at how much fresh air per person. Yes, no? How much? Twelve CFM per person is something we can say. And then one of you needs to volunteer, take some time to look at the ASHRAE handbook and say what, see what's the latest recommendation on fresh air quantity. <coughs> so uh, you will take that on, right? I want you to demonstrate you are a little more interested than others. Find out the fresh air quantity per person between now and the next session. So we have said 12 CFM per person, fresh air. Cooling capacity now we can see will be a function of insulation, our willingness to alter the rooms. There will be some radiation load coming because of exposure to some rooms to the sun. Sorry? Cubic feet per minute. So more appropriately, I think I should get used to defining it as meter cube per second, right? It is, it is a flow rate which, um, so there have been concerns with air conditioning. So not everything about air conditioning has always been uh, positive when it comes to health concerns. So when a lot of buildings found a good correlation between uh, productivity of employees and air conditioning, there were huge amounts spent on air conditioning. As a consequence of that expense, it was also noted that the amount of air you get into the building is a direct load and cost. So it led to attempts to reduce that to the extent possible and it led to a sick building syndrome. So it was discovered to be a health hazard because CO2 levels increased, people started uh, not being at the most attentive levels and out of that came a concern which was addressed by a committee, a committee that went into details of what amount of air is enough. So initially they thought of 20 CFM per person and when they looked at 20 CFM, the cost of that was very high. Think about uh, afternoon, June months. Right. If your temperatures are going to be 43 to 46, if you are taking 20 CFM per person, you will load the air conditioning system in a big way and that cost will become significant. So compliance will become an issue. So then there were more uh, tests or studies done and I believe the new number is 12 CFM per person. So that gives us an idea of uh, something that is directly impacting the occupants and we looked at um, insulation having an impact on the total load, orientation of the host, hostels are going to have an impact, which rooms are exposed and therefore uh, we need to look at differentiating. So we will have to define different types of rooms that are there. So it looks like just defining clearly what is needed will take anywhere between uh, a month <coughs> to two months provided we put in good quality resources. Right. So this gives you a flavor of what I meant in the last session when I was talking about translating a need into articulating it, articulating it in a way that when we meet it, then the target uh, customer will benefit. So what do we do next? We have got the requirements uh, clearly. Assume we have done the work, we have talked to people, we looked at the solar incidents uh, and uh, we have come to a number that we need X tons per hostel. And again, it will not be a common number, it will be different for different uh, hostels depending on their orientation and number of uh, rooms and all that. So what do we do next then? So we are addressing it as a design problem. So what is the first component that we go about selecting? So for purposes of, um, again, clarity and uh, making an assumption, we will say 200 tons. This is just a number. It is not based on any calculation that I would have considered. So we need 200 tons. So what are the options that come to my mind? I would say one ton into 200 is one clear option. 
I don't need too much of engineering, just define a tender, people will quote and then they will install and everyone will have peace of mind. On karna on karu, off karna off karu. Simple, right? Or I will look at something else. So the next uh, least complex system could be what? One is to one inverter system. So this I was talking about a conventional on off low price system. So if you looked at differentiating technology and giving individual user a choice, then we would go to a one is to one inverter system. So one of the things you can do is start looking at some websites where you look at manufacturers, get familiar with the different types of air conditioners as if the first thing is that you had to do this without getting too much of support from me. You still could get people comfortable, right, with whatever is the known level of technology today. <coughs> it is budget and making a choice. If you were to buy air conditioner for your room, for your home, you would do that by yourself. You would consult a few people and then you would make the decision, someone will install and you will hold the compress, the company supplying it, liable in case anything went wrong. So, so this part requires very little understanding of design, it is just pure connect with what the end user needs. So do that and in that process you will become familiar. Then what, what is the next thing that we can do? We can look at uh, every wing. So we have wings in every hostel, right? Like by wing I mean some, something which allows for a duct to go outside uh, the glass area and let's say we have room 1, we have room 2, room 3 and so on. So something like 20 rooms. So all of them have air coming in and then there is a connect to each of them and there is another duct which takes the return air back. So you get this principle and that would mean uh, an assumption that uh, when air conditioning is needed, everyone is around. So it would, uh, a typical wing, how many, uh, 15 rooms? If you wanted to have a simple uh, architecture of uh, making the ducts, 15 rooms to, a, and then we could start looking at a 15 ton system. what next we could think of. So if you go to various uh, air conditioner manufacturer website, you will look at chillers and some very highly efficient chillers and you may want to exploit diversity and again give every individual a choice. So like in hotel rooms, so that could be another uh, approach, right? So which means uh, And what would be the complexity encountered here? So we look at one is to one systems, some more one is to one efficient systems, then you look at ducted systems which could end up being uh, fewer in number than the individual units and then you're looking at a single central chiller. So what would be the complexity here? Piping. Huh, so all the rooms need to get piping. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But if I was uh, discussing with you, I would say piping in any case you have to do because even if you put split systems, you would need piping. So what other uh, limitations would be there? <coughs> right. So we need to look at uh, a chiller which is able to address adjusting loads, right. Sorry? Like for every floor we have to install some air handling units <coughs> and we might have to 
might not find the space to yeah, but no, the solution that I'm talking about is individual fan coil units. So these are uh, water inside the phenon tube condenser, uh, sorry, phenon tube evaporator. So you have a terminal unit. They're not called evaporator because there's no evaporation happening there. Chilled water is supplied at uh, 7 degrees C, leaves at 12. And uh, every unit can be switched on and off. And then there is a flow controller. So it's like a hotel or a, a multi um, centrally air-conditioned apartment complex. The room size is such that one ton is a good assumption, right? Most rooms will be sufficiently cooled with one ton of air conditioning. The only point of caution would be the rooms which are on the top floor, which have an exposed roof area. So there, one of the comments that I heard was insulation. So insulation plus this together would be. What other solution could we have? And the, the final one would be uh, the VRV systems, where we have indoor units and uh, <coughs> common. I would stay away from that simply because of uh, issues to do with breakdowns. Given that it is a, uh, it is not such a controlled facility and um, uh, potential for uh, damage to piping could lead to the entire uh, hostel being uh, at the impact of no air conditioning. So, but as, but as an option, that is also an option. So now if you, if you make these options um, and then you have to compare them, what would you compare them on? So you are the end user, you are taking the decision. So now let's say that you are in the director's chair or the <coughs> dean's chair, whoever is the person <coughs> responsible for the decision. So how would you make a decision? So cost would be, of course, the most important one is cost. And when you say cost is what? Initial cost? <coughs> we use the word operating cost. Is one of the same thing what you mean? What else? Efficiency in indirectly included in the operating cost. Okay. And now, how would you measure reliability? Okay. Uh, so some some things you can analyze straight away. Like we talked about the multi indoor outdoor, you know that there is a better reliability with the one to one system because at most how many, two percent, five percent will go down, but everyone else will have. So that is a factor that you will consider. But how about reliability of uh, the complete system? How do you address that? In fact, when I was um, in my initial uh, um, uh, few jobs, reliability was one of the difficult things to address because you can't really <coughs> measure it. When you're making a purchase decision, you can't. You rely on the manufacturer's commitment and whatever is historical data available for other customers using the same equipment. There is a mathematical way of defining reliability. If you were to know each component reliability, then you could stack them all together and you could predict the, the reliability of uh, the system. What else would you consider? What about environment? So being a technology institute, a premier technology institute, you would like to set a good example, right? So the moment you take on, yeah. Then, is water um, in short supply in IIT? It is, right? So you would therefore look for an air-cooled uh, solution over a water-cooled solution, right? But we will put it as a consideration, right? So having put this all together, and let's say that out of all deliberations and everything else, the final conclusion reached is that it is going to be a one is to one system, simple. And that too without any modulation, like on off. 
because with, with whatever deliberation you did with potential users, all students, it came out that the maximum use was nighttime use. Nighttime temperatures are pretty constant. Daytime people are going to be in the institute. The estimated running hours are only the weekends. And therefore, it does not make sense to incur a high initial cost for the advantage, the small advantage that is there in the operating cost. So then what would we do? Let me share, you know, my own experience because some of you feel When I I was fond of design, you know, when I joined Fedders Lloyd, which was a, a not so well known company than the company I worked for, which was Imperial Chemical Industries, and then before that I was in Procter and Gamble. So each of these companies, I got opportunities to apply what I knew, but in a very different way. That things are known, just execute. And I felt somewhere constrained in, in expressing myself and ability or opportunity to do something new. So I opted for a job where I got the opportunity to be a manager in design and development for Fedders Lloyd. And I, I was very excited. When I went there and the first problem thrown at me was design an air conditioner for Indian Railways. It's going to be a roof mounted air conditioner for Indian Railways and it must work. And I was at my wit's end as to how do I start. <coughs> because any theory that I had been exposed to in IIT was not giving me a straightforward way to start uh, solving the problem. I knew what is Reynolds number, I knew how it relates to heat transfer, but where to start? I mean, totally in a, in a state and then I wasn't reporting to anyone. Like they thought a person from IIT uh, comes in, he'll be able to do magic. You know, we don't need anything else. So, so now the thing was that there were systems working before I was having to face a design problem. So there were systems working as package units, split systems and all that. And the one thing that helped me a lot was the ability to conceptualize and build designs using parameters. So there is a design known, it works at 35 degrees centigrade, it does a certain amount of heat transfer. And then I had not known how carrier learned air conditioning, but later on when I got to know, I ended up doing almost something similar. That whatever is known, you put together a system and test it out. When you test it out, you get the performance. You get to know how much it cools, what are the issues, what power consumption, what cost, which components are reliable, which are not, because you stress it out. And that is how I learned. And then some of it that I learned was, uh, I'm going to discuss in one of the case studies, but what I learned was having sent the units to Indian Railways, they were installed on Rajdhani trains, and they were moving between um, Delhi and Mumbai, and there were no problems. And I was quite excited. I made a design, I made a design, I made a design. But I had not learned noise and vibration. I, in fact, skipped that course altogether in IIT because it was too mathematical. And I thought, you know, whatever I like is what I should do, not, you know, what is needed. So what I discover in my job is that that was the part that was missing. So when the same design went in on a different track between Delhi and Amritsar, the track conditions were not the same as a well-maintained track between Delhi and Mumbai. So there were failures happening every trip. And suddenly, from a position of glory and prestige, I was like, target, Gupinder doesn't know how to design a product. <laughs> Everyone became a designer. You know, my project ke log the, unko, tumne ye vibration eliminator nahi lagaya, yahan pe tumne competitor ne aise kiya, aapne aise nahi kiya. A whole lot of things were being thrown as to, um, you know, why this didn't work. And what, what helped was me recognizing that there is an area where I am not strong, which is analysis of the root cause of this. So it was, I was in Delhi and I approached the professors here and uh, I had a consultancy project signed up. And it was a petty amount, like 25,000 rupees for a project that gets so much business to a company is nothing. But it was designed, the whole thing was designed in a way that um, the know-how, the knowledge part comes from IIT, the measurement equipment comes from IIT and the experimental part happens in a industrial scenario. So that the parts of, about speed, you know, you know how difficult it is to run an experiment in IIT, getting all parts together, the time required. Whereas in industry, you can really uh, make it um, much faster because it's urgent. So that combination helped us reach a point that we could address that issue. And now the units run. Details of that I will share more when we have that particular session. But when you don't, you enter an area where nothing is known, it's still possible to make progress. So you today are in a scenario where there is so much advancement, 100 years of legacy we have in air conditioning design. And there was a time when there was not much happening in the area of design because it was taken for granted that the design of an air conditioner is simple, thumb rule, do this, 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 and it can be made. <coughs> Only when there was concern for the environment, need for changing refrigerants, 
that uh, things began to move and then energy efficiency became a big the moment people recognized that 70% of the energy is being used for comfort and cooling purposes there was a lot of emphasis that came back because it meant money <clears throat> and then today it is an area where there is a lot of r&d happening in terms of evolving new systems and uh, making them work analyze them look at newer technology scroll compressors came into being because of the need for energy efficiency and reliability the number of parts got cut down phenomenally so if any of you is feeling a little you know lost ki hum kya discuss kar rahe hain it's fine you know in a, in a in a design role you will sometimes have unknowns you will need to grapple with things that you've not done before so let's start grappling with designing a 1 ton air conditioner kaise karenge we have the design conditions so we said 25 and uh, 50% rh so 25 degree c and 19 degree c wbt so we look at um, comfort load it's a combination of uh, sensible and latent and for you to appreciate that all of us are breathing right so we are adding some moisture in the environment that we are so we need to remove that moisture so there will be comfort load which will be let's say 0.7 tons and 0.3 tons of what we term as latent load and then we look at the psychometric chart and define an evaporating temperature that we need in the coil this design temperature will pretty much be a function of these two <coughs> so let's say we come to a conclusion that this is 7 degree centigrade so at 7 degree centigrade we are able to meet the ratio of um, latent and sensible load and then what do we do next so we could do one of the two things we could look at the evaporator heat exchanger design or we could look at choosing the compressor my typical approach is to look at compressor selection so look for a compressor that will give me 1 ton at 5 degree centigrade or 7 degree centigrade sorry so we choose a compressor and in choosing a compressor we need to look at uh, refrigerant choices so far design was pretty simple use r22 and go forward now for environmental reasons we will look at 410a and we will look at 410a not for a very long time because we will look for a refrigerant which will also not have a high global warming potential right sorry sir again 134 134 is typically going for refrigeration applications not so much for air conditioning and there is actually no uh, <coughs> prevalent uh, alternative to 410a at the moment so most designs uh, that are happening today like if you are designing today then you will just opt for uh, 410a and you could consider uh, propane for a small uh, size air conditioner like uh, one ton so one of the manufacturers in india godrej had some assistance from uh, a german company and they have uh, produced and sold um, 20000 plus air conditioners using propane <coughs> i'm a little skeptical about that because when you install air conditioners with exposed pipelines using a flammable gas when people are going to address it for in case of a uh, risk like fire in case of you uh, not having enough knowledge about how to handle a flammable refrigerant then those are things that have not been fully discussed and addressed in a standard and and the the kind of limitation that we face in india is that there aren't strict regulations that are in place to prevent such eventuality <coughs> so china has taken a long time before uh, they've said uh, you know they will go ahead with this europe is still um, not clear whether or not the only thing that has happened so far is that in us refrigerators with propane are accepted in europe they were accepted for a long time in india they've been sold for a long time so for small systems where the charge quantity is really low uh, propane butane have been accepted as refrigerants and they are so the reason to bring in this conversation is that they have uh, no risk both for uh, global warming or for ozone depletion so for those environmental reasons they are safe but they have a flammability risk which for smaller systems is addressed by technology the way you seal the system the way you manufacture it and finally an evaluation of the overall risk 
if there was to be a leak in the system. So, compressor selection will require a combination of um, evaporating temperature, refrigerant and then condensing temperature. We are going to pump heat. So, and the max operating conditions. So, max operating conditions is something like defining an operating envelope. While we will do a design at a fixed point, we need to keep in mind what are the extreme conditions in which this compressor must operate. So, if we have all this, we would go to a compressor performance curve. We look at available compressors from different manufacturers and then look for one which delivers one ton with a reasonable cost as well as good performance, means a good energy efficiency ratio. So, it is pretty. <clears throat> so, when I was talking about my experience, so compressor selection came easy, you know, so long as I could relate what railways wanted unfortunately that was a, a customer uh, which was clear on what amount of cooling load they have so no issues on on the requirements part it was straight translated into a compressor choice mm -hmm. and it was a reciprocating compressor at that time which was uh, about no it was exactly 4.3 tons at rating conditions but then uh, the reason we do this exercise is that we are not always concerned with the rating condition we are looking for the design condition and the design condition <coughs> for uh, railways was uh, 5 degrees centigrade evaporating and uh, 60 condensing. It was 57 at one time then increased to 60. So, under those conditions we had to guarantee 3.3 tons per compressor. So, that came I mean for that not too much of work except get to the right compressor performance curve. 